Um, we uh, had uh, uh, planned on mailing, doing a mailer this week, and I ran into a snag. I had everything together yesterday except the list, and I tried to pull it today, and now they're saying they want to deliver that to me until the 3rd of January. So we'll get that to you next week, and we'll, you folks have volunteered to help address envelopes. Thank you, and I appreciate your help, and we'll get those to you next week, and we'll get that out. Colossians chapter number 3. Glad you made it this afternoon. Good to have you in service with you, with us. And um, we'll begin by praying, and then we'll get into the lesson. Let's pray. Father, it's been a good day being in your house, and I thank you for letting us gather together. Thank you for your saints. Uh, Lord, I pray this afternoon we'll feed your children. I ask that uh, you'll encourage your hearts as we look forward to things above. God, give me a clear mind to teach, and then I pray that your Holy Spirit will minister to the people that have gathered this evening. Thank you for for each one is taking their time to spend in your house. And now, Lord, I pray a special blessing for everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been, uh, we started a series of lessons about affections above all others. And uh, just kind of go back and reintroduce. Uh, I keep moving this projector around. If you see me move it again, it's because I can't seem to get it where I want it to be. Um, well, it's going to happen again. Da, da, da. You know, I don't know if any of you ever dealt with projectors and things like that, but see, if you turn it this way, it's slanted. You turn it that way, it's slanted. You'd think it'd just kind of go one way or the other, but anyway, so uh, me being my uh, hung up self, um, I'll get there. Ah, right, go back. Introduction. Uh, study, really, we've talked to start this uh, talk about how to have true happiness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, I don't find a lot of happiness. Of course, we've talked about what happiness, happiness and joy, where they're very similar, they're, they're entirely different. Uh, joy is anticipation of a coming good. It's good looking down the road and saying, you know, God's got something good, this is what God's doing, and we have joy in that. Happiness has a lot to do with where we are today uh, or what is happening in our life. And what happens to us is often we get down and out. We get sad because things are not going well. And so uh, we want to talk about some things this afternoon. Uh, that would focus on us on our happiness today and overall joy. Um, happiness is experienced when the object of our affections uh, meets our expectation. And then uh, we find that unhappiness comes when that object of our affection or that object that we have put our hope and trust in or that thing that we love doesn't meet our objections and then we have unhappiness. We ought to have happiness all the time. We ought to find joy as well. Um, there's where it is. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 2. God says, here's where to put your affection. This is where you need to be looking and keeping your mind on in order to have this joy in your life and this happiness. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, if ye be risen with Christ, and we find the first hint there, you must be born again. In order to have this true joy, this happiness in your life, uh, you've got to know the Lord. It says, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse number two, set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth. And it talks about looking ahead. Look at things above. This world will let you down. If you, watch your, if you look around you today, just the people you're dealing with, it'll let you down. If you have expectations, uh, it'll let you down. I, me, I've tried my whole life to sell stuff, and it seems like I can't ever sell something for what I've got in it. I always take a loss on it. I, I would make the world's worst salesman anywhere. I have this expectation of uh, buying something and man, it's going to, I'm going to be able to sell it and I'm going to make my favorite sales story. I bought baseball cards. I don't know if any of you ever dealt with baseball cards before. I bought thousands of baseball cards at auction. Uh, they were taken in a, um, some kind of police raid and there were stacks of them. And so I got to go look at them before, and I'm trying to figure out how many they are and what I'll give a piece for them. So I actually counted baseball cards out, and a hundred of them was so tall, and so I went over to the police station, and put them down and measured it, and figured out how many baseball cards they were selling, and I figured out what I'd give a piece for them, and so uh, I, I bid on them, and, and I won. I am going to make, man, all card tycoon of the world. Well, okay, I'm a little lofty, but pretty good stack of cards. And so I went, and I won the auction, and I went, and I got the baseball cards, and I took them home. You know what I got most out of those baseball cards? I got a great education. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, you yeah, go. I have learned uh, what a Don Russ baseball card is. I've also learned about Fleer baseball cards. And I've learned all about, you know what I learned mostly about those? Those baseball cards I bought, those stacks and stacks in the 80s, in the late 80s and early 90s, Don Russ and Fleer produced billions of them. <laughs> and I had a stack of the billions. Uh, you know, I couldn't give those. By the way, if anybody likes some baseball cards, if you'll see me after service, I've had those for years. I'll be glad to part with them. And uh, anyway, uh, so we look around around us today and we have this stuff in this world and we think man we're going to do all right I, I got this going on I'm going to do that and this great thing is going to happen one thing I found consistently in the world one thing I can really count on in this world is you can't count on this world you really want to find joy you want to find happiness stop looking around you today get your eyes on something beautiful get your eyes on something coming that are above and so that's what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. Only the things that are above, only the things coming, uh, bring permanence, bring joy. Uh, that's the only thing that you'll ever be able to count on. The things that God's done has been untouched by man, untouched by sin, uh, the beautiful things that are ahead. And there is real, if not more so, than what we have here today. All our earthly affection ought to be aligned with heavenly affections. Uh, in previous weeks, we talked about some things that are above. Uh, when we looked at some of the earlier slides, uh, we said that our reward is above. Uh, God has promised a reward for those who serve. We looked at some of those rewards scripturally. God talks about some things that await the saint for faithful service. Uh, we also talked about the Word of God and what He's going to do with it. Some of the things we believe He's going to do with it, it's above. We ought to set our affections on it. That's something we got here that the Bible says will be in heaven. It is settled forever in heaven, that Bible we've got. We talked about treasure above. And last week we talked about some of the treasure uh, that we face us as we go up uh, in the future. As we look above and what's coming in the future. Today I want to consider some other things that are above. I'd like to give you a few more. The creations of God are above. Uh, that to me is an amazing thing. I, I, listen, when I think about what the Lord has prepared in uh, we find that Isaiah said this he said in the year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord also sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple now hang on don't you think use, use your mind just a minute here he is transported uh, God has brought him giving him a vision if you will and in the vision he's standing before the Lord God now I don't know about you but that, that's humbling <laughs> uh, I walk through here, and old church buildings are, are an interesting place to be. Uh, but I've walked through the building of the day, and I, and I imagine, Lord, what would it be like to walk in and see the Lord just standing there, and He goes, "Hey, I need to talk to you." Man, I'll tell you, fall down, you know, and all. And Isaiah shows up at the throne room, and the first thing that he's caught isn't the splendor; it's not the river running out of the throne. It's not the streets of gold. You know, people talk about all those things. When he shows up in the throne room, he says this. He said, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. He shows him in his majesty. It shows him ruling in power. God, there's some things that really bug me. I heard a preacher do Well, scratch that. I heard a guy that's supposed to be a preacher one time in a wedding made the comment about the man, old man upstairs. I could have punched him in the face. They would have probably arrested me, but you're talking about disrespectful. I serve a God, and he is not old, he is not feeble, and he's not a man. Isaiah steps there, and he looks. The Lord God is sitting on a throne, and it's not just kind of a throne. It's not just a throne. The Bible said it's high and lifted up. He's, he's beholding the majesty of the Lord God. And there when he looks, it says his train. This thing that comes from him, if you will, his garment, uh, if you could almost imagine, fills the temple. This Whatever's coming from him, it just kind of fills up the sun. See, God takes second place to no one. This is a glimpse of what you'll see someday. And there he sees him sitting there high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it, above the throne, there's attendants there at the throne room of God. According to the scripture, there at the throne room of God are the cherubim 
And the cherubim, I believe, based upon what we saw in the temple, the cherubim very well, maybe almost 20 feet tall, with a wingspan of almost 20 feet. They're, I believe, standing beside or below the, the throne, but above the throne is his beast. And the Lord calls them seraphim. If I remember right, I think they're found four or six times in the Bible. Won't swear to that, but you find the seraphim. And there the seraphim, he has six wings. And Isaiah sees first the Lord. And he's taken aback to the Lord. And then he sees these beasts that the Lord has created. And the beasts have got six wings. And he takes two of the wings, he covers his feet. And with two, he does fly. And he's looking at this miraculous, unbelievable creature. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And notice when he does this, when he cries out, this tells us there's a door to that throne room. The post of that door began to rattle and shake and quiver just from the voice of this beast that's flying, praising the Lord God. See, God don't like share his glory with anything you'll find here. And this beast praises him and it rattles. And I believe not only does it shake the doorpost, I try to put my place where Isaiah would have been. I think it rattled him inside. The majesty, the power of just his voice rattles inside of him. And he feels that trembling and the rumbling in the throne room. And let me show you what he did. Just this glimpse. The four verses right there, here's what he said. He stands there, and man, he is smitten. He says, whoa, is me. Whoa, is me. He says, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. He marveled at the holiness of this place. He felt filthy, dirty, nasty. Whoa, is me. I'm, I'm unclean. I, he said, no, am I unclean? He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't even speak this. I, I'm so dirty, I shouldn't even be talking. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Those that I dwell in, even the words are, are accursed. And he says, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's a glimpse. Just a glimpse. When we see him, it's going to be nothing like nothing you've ever seen here. He's going to take you aback. Man, people said, no man... I don't believe any man alive. I don't believe every man in the flesh has ever seen God. There's a reason. There is something about the mortality of man and the presence of such holiness. That's what's above. That's what's waiting. We find that some of these beasts that are waiting there, we just talked about the seraphim. The seraphim, Isaiah 6, 1 through 4, we read about that, and he talked about the seraphim, verse number 2, these seraphim that we're talking about, they are connected in some way with the cleansing of the saint. Uh, we're going to find that later on in that chapter, verse number 6, that seraphim is going to fly and he's going to take a coal off of the altar and he's going to purify his lips. He's going to cleanse him uh, with that coal. And he's got something to do with the cleansing of the saint. I don't think we fully understand what these marvelous creatures that God's created are for, but they're all creations of God and they're all for his glory. Then flew one of the seraphim, verse 6, unto me having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Uh, then something else that's above. We're talking about things that are above that someday you and I will see and experience. There is an archangel. Now, listen carefully to me. I've told on this a number of times, but it's important that you get the fact there is a archangel. Or, if we want to use the correct English probably an archangel. I don't know what you say. Hey, you got to say an, but an archangel. There is not multiple archangels. I hear some of the dumbest things. People talk about all the archangels. There's not a lot of archangels. There's only one. He is the ark or the chief angel, if you will. This archangel. I don't think we fully understand any of these beasts. We can get we get glimpses. Uh, I I know in mythology often they talk about seven archangels. There's no such thing. There's one, and his name is Michael. These are prints that stands for Israel. And for time's sake, I give you the scripture. If you'd like to look them up, you're welcome to do that. But we'll find in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13, verse 21, and then chapter 12, verse 1, we'll find this one called Michael, this archangel. He stands for Israel. 
He has a very special role. One called Michael commands the army, if not an army, the army of heaven. Find Revelation 12, 7 through 9. Uh, also, something unusual about Michael. He seems to be connected with the resurrection. He will have a part in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, we find that in the resurrection of Moses, Jude 9, he buried Moses. Uh, so basically he was put there uh, and will resurrect him someday. He was part of the rapture. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 it talks about, for the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with the shout, the voice of the archangel, the archangel. Something about the rapture. He'll have some part in that. Uh, the Lord has designated that. Uh, and then the final resurrection, we find both Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation 20. Michael is involved with that final resurrection in some way. Uh, he has a part in that. So somehow he is there for the redemption of Israel. He is the chief prince that stands for them. And we find that he someday will have some part in our resurrection. Someday we'll see this one called Michael. There's another one called Gabriel. Gabriel is not an archangel, was never called an archangel. He's very unusual, known as Gabriel. He's associated with God's redemptive work. Uh, the work that God does to redeem lost man. It may be for all eternity as the expanse of God's kingdom continues that he's involved with redemption. Don't know. Uh, he informs Daniel of Christ's first coming. Daniel 8, 16, 9, 21 through 27. He tells Daniel that the Lord himself is coming someday. Uh, we also find he holds a very lofty position. In Luke chapter 1 in verse number 19, he stands in the presence of the Lord. Uh, this one called Gabriel. I believe today, if you could see the throne room of God today, and you were to see the Lord high and lifted up, I believe you would see him standing at attention, waiting for the dispatch, or waiting to do the will of the Lord God. Uh, this one called Gabriel, he announced John the Baptist's birth in uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 13. And then we find that he appears again later on to announce the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he has something to do with redemption somewhere along the way. And as the Lord is the Redeemer, he announced his coming. This one called a Gabriel. We would see him there in the things above. We find there are these creatures that we call cherubim, or if you want to plural, cherubim. Ezekiel 1, 5 through 10. Uh, interesting because the word cherubim means the burning one or the burners. Uh, they're the guards of God's holiness. Um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, 22 through 24, Exodus 25, 17 through 22. When God took man and put him out of the Garden of Eden, he posted the Eden, or there at the Garden of Eden, to prevent man's entry into that or anyone else. And so we find that, that they are used of the Lord in some way to guard. A cherubim would keep a sinful man out of heaven. Uh, people seem to think today that everyone's going to go to heaven. They're not. Um, God would have all men to go to heaven. You know, God says he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But if man, if evil man could go to heaven, I, I thought about that yesterday, by the way. Can you imagine man's vision of getting to heaven? Uh, I think the Tower of Babel very well may have been an opportunity or a man trying to build a tower to get to God. Uh, he's not going to do it. Man today, he thinks he's so clever, and he has these little <coughs> bottle rockets. The United States spends billions of dollars on bottle rockets to shoot these little flares up into the sky. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to prove there is no God. You ever realized how short that distance is that they're trying to go? They made it to the moon. So what? I went to Wyoming. Big deal. Uh, and I'm not impressed. This the vastness of the universe that we have is of such that man can only theorize what is at the far reaches. And what God has done is God has this place called heaven and below is a universe. And then down here in the center, I believe, is the earth. And the distance between the two, God has put it in such a way that man of himself could never reach where God is without his intervention. He chooses to protect, if you will, 
he himself and man with that. See, if man could ever approach heaven, if man could ever get there, I believe the cherubim would keep them from ever approaching or entering heaven. Uh, of course, man, that's theoretical. Man could never do that because lost condition will keep him out. Uh, Lucifer was a cherubim before he fell. I believe the Bible taught, called him the anointed cherub that covered it. And it's very possible as I look at cherubs, I believe that it's possible that their wings touch. And we find illustrations of this as we look at Ezekiel's vision of them and those wings begin to touch. And I think that perhaps Satan rode those cherubs at that time. I believe the Lord also will do that. Uh, we find that the king's highway was another study. Lucifer was a cherub before his fall, Ezekiel 28, verse 14, the cherubim. Uh, then we find, I believe, that there's a group that we would see in heaven today that the scripture called the morning stars. The Bible tells us in Job chapter 38, verse number 6, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? Verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, God laid a cornerstone. God did some things in the formation of that. And I believe that these sons of God shouted with joy. And I believe there was some creature, something that's been created by the Lord God called the morning stars that sang together. We're going to hear someday music we've never experienced. There's a phenomenon uh, that some people have. Some claims a distortion. Some claims it's just phenomena that they can actually see shades or glimpses of colors when they hear music. Is it possible that some of the things we may experience in heaven? I don't know. But I do know that what's above here is what we have here is just a shadow of what's above. And we find those that will sing in that day and we'll hear that singing. The angels. We call them angels. The word angel in the Bible simply means a messenger, but there are some that are heavenly messengers. And we find them in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Uh, we find that they were very similar to men. They cohabitated with the women, and the giants were produced from that offspring. They're very powerful. Uh, 1 Kings nineteen thirty five. We find one angel killed tens of thousands in one night. Sometimes they're invisible. Uh, we find Elisha at Dothan, and there the angel protected them from the armies that came. And then we found uh, Balaam in Numbers 22. He was riding his ass, and uh, the ass wouldn't go any further because there was an angel in front of him that stopped him in his way. Again, they can be seen or unseen. Let me tell you something about angels before I move on with that. Don't get caught up in the New Age movement of angelology today. Angels aren't dogs. Angels aren't women. Angels don't appear as babies. Angels don't appear as little kids. You'll never find any of that. Scripture. They always appear as grown men. And they have a, a masculine appearance to them. And so thus, when we talk about angels, they have a specific purpose. And that purpose is to carry out the will of God and carry his messages. The angelic creations of God are all above. Such affection on things above. And then you got the angel of the Lord. I find the angel of the Lord in the Bible. In the Old Testament you find it's the Lord himself. You'll find him being the angel of the Lord. Uh, or it can be others as well. Uh, unidentified, Judges chapter 6, verse 21 through 22. Uh, in that one, in verse 22, it said, an angel of the Lord, not the angel. Uh, we also find that there are others. Matthew 1, verse 20, 28, verse 2. The angel of the Lord appears there. It wasn't Christ. He was here. Uh, so we find the angel of the Lord. Don't know what that is, but all that's above. There are things above yet that we have not comprehended. God's determined affection. Get your mind on things above. These are things that are more real than what you have around you today. If today, if your eyes could be opened, if my eyes could be opened at what's going on around us, I think it would startle us. I think the battle that goes on around us today I don't think we grasp. Oh, you're so finite in material and everything we see, and we don't see the things around us, uh, the devils, the angels, those that are involved in things that we can't possibly dream of. But I'm telling you, I'm going to a place someday that that conflict will not be going on, a place where it will be only holy, 
there where the creation of God is. And in that Revelation chapter 14 verse number 11. The scripture says thou art worthy O Lord to receive all glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And as I am a son of God. As I have been born again and are being created in the image of Christ. As they bring him pleasure someday they'll bring me and you great pleasure. I don't think you and I can imagine big enough what awaits us. I remember a few years back, uh, Linda's mom was living with us, and I watched her try to explain to, I think it was Jason, one of my children, they'd never seen snow. And she tried to explain to them what snow was. Now that child... As she tried to explain, it's this white stuff that falls. From, can you imagine trying to explain to a child what snow is, a child that's never seen snow? And she, for 20 or 30 minutes, tried to explain snow, and they were asking her questions, and they just weren't getting what snow was. They didn't get it until the snow started. And I remember that year, it was a huge snow that fell. And I remember the wonder of that child as they looked out and saw that. That's us. We you see, catch glimpses and we've read all these things in the Word of God. And God gives us glimpses and He gives us some ideals. But our mind is so finite. What we've seen is with our eyes and the things that we've felt in this life and we've decided this is the way heaven's going to be. Oh, I don't think that our minds dream big enough yet. God is not what you and I think. Unless it's revealed in this Bible. If it's not given you in the Word of God, be careful about your imagination. Um, I don't think that we've quite seen Him in His majesty yet. All these are things I'm going to see someday. You know, I've been saved for a long time. I've been saved over 50 years. Over 50 years I've been born again. And a good number of those years, I've been in love with a, with a man that I've never met. Uh, a good number of those years, I have served someone uh, that I've never seen. I've never heard his voice. I've read about the spirit that lives inside me has revealed some things about him, but it's not the same as the day that I see Christ. Oh, finally, when our mind is perfect, our senses are perfect. And there he stands, the Lord God of glory. Oh, we're going to have things revealed to us that day we can't possibly today wrap our mind around. Can't imagine big enough what God's created for his pleasure. Colossians 3, verse number 2. And if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above not on things of the earth a lot of things down here are a lot easier for me to deal with these days because I see a better day coming I see something different waiting on me oh glimpses we had uh, Christmas this past week and I told the families we gathered in I said relish relish tonight uh, we had some relish that night, but that wasn't the kind of relish I was talking about. We had olives and cheese and the same old stuff that we always have. And, and that's good. I get to eat bad at least one night out of the year. And I told him, I said, but the reason you should relish tonight, I said, there will be precious few of these nights. This night, being Christmas Eve, is a wonderful time because my kids are all here. All my grandkids are here. My mom's here. There'll be very few of those nights coming. And I'll tell you that here, church. Relish this day here as we sit here because there'll be very few of these days left. We're going home sooner than later. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, if, if God gave me another 10 years, that would mean my appointed... That's 10 more Christmases. So I believe this. I believe that my time of my dwelling here, my sojourning as we would say it's short, so is yours ah oh, but I sure am looking forward I am looking forward to the trip 
I've got some things down here that are precious to me. I'd like to see my grandkids grow up. But you know there's got to be an end. And when they get grown, I'd want to see my great-grandkids growing up. Now, there comes an end to everything. Uh, but my faith is, is not the end of things and the inevitable that comes. My faith is based upon things that are above. Set your affection on things above. Precious times here, but oh, it's nothing like what's waiting on us when we get home. Set your affection on things above. Next time we meet, we want to talk about some things above that are very practical. Let's stand. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Next week, we talk about affection above all others. Week four.